Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on moderation. Um, just as a quick uh, question to start with, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Great. In which case, what would they do without that? Yeah. Because um, it's talking a comfortably, comfortable but loudish volume. So, um, my name is Jeremy Dawson. Uh, this is my colleague Mika Bronka. Um, and uh, you'll notice the third name on the screen, Andreas Richter, who's a colleague of ours, um, who submitted this PDW with us, but in the way that Academy sometimes happens, had another one scheduled at exactly the same time. So we figured we could cover this one between the two of us. And um, if you wanted to hear Andreas specifically, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you'll have to wait for another occasion. Uh, but this session is uh, basically uh, covering a wide variety of topics around moderation. We're going to start by taking it from a fairly uh, low base, not presuming much knowledge there, but also getting onto far more complex models by the time we're done um, in just under two hours' time. Um, now, there are some resources that may be of use to you. Um, in particular, uh, at the website that you see, it's got the URL at the bottom, and it's also got the uh, QR code there. We'll show that a few more times before the end of the session. Um, it includes links to the slides we're using, includes links to a, a, an example data set that we're uh, using for examples, and some syntax that uh, we have been put together in three different software packages, SPSS, R, and Stata, um, because we think these are the three most commonly used ones for people who attend Academy. Um, there's also links to some Excel templates, which uh, I'll be talking about uh, a little bit later on. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. Um, one is, um, I think, although I'm not quite sure how this is working this year, there will be uh, some evaluation forms uh, which are distributed at the end. Um, and so if you have uh, a moment to the end to evaluate what we've talked about, that would be great. You know, we may well off with this again in future years, we'll see. Um, so if there's anything that can be improved on or if anything particularly like, it's worth telling us about that. Um, the other is just about questions. I'm sure you're going to have questions at different points. Um, there will be opportunities, specific opportunities, to ask those questions um, at different stages when we sort of complete a, a little section of it. Um, I would, we, we ask that you retain your questions for those points, unless it's something um, you know, going wrong behind me or uh, something that you didn't quite understand me saying or whatever. Um, in which case you can ask uh, for clarification. Uh, just otherwise, it, it, I know from experience, we need to keep this moving to get through all the material. So, um, yes, so I'll put that QR code up again uh, in a moment. But actually, on this next slide, it's a different QR code. I'm going to let people talk about this. Yeah, I have this hobby of uh, putting all my teams and staff online on my YouTube channel. And when we were preparing uh, this session, I took a look at what material I have about moderation and interaction models. And I made this short collection of six videos for you. Uh, and this covers some of the things that we talk about this seminar and also with some of the things that go beyond. And uh, please subscribe and hit the notification button to never miss out a video as they are professional YouTubers say. All right. Uh, one more thing, I'm recording this, and I'm not sure if I'm going to ever publish it anywhere, but if you uh, say something and you object to your voice being heard on the internet, please send me an email, and, send me an email, and I will then uh, edit, either edit you out or not publish it. Great. Yeah, thank you. So, I'm just going to give a, a few minutes broad overview to what moderation is, because I expect most of you will have some idea about moderation, which is why you're here in the first place. Um, but it does relate to a broad category of different types of model. 
which are connected by one main thing, which is that a relationship or a set of relationships differs depending on the value of one or more other variables. Um, so very often, we'd be concerned with a link between an independent and a dependent variable, um, and that particular relationship, either its strength or its existence or its direction, might differ depending on what a third variable, a moderating variable, um, was doing. Uh, and we'll look at a range of different types of uh, moderation. Um, incidentally, I'll talk about moderation, I'll talk about interaction. Um, broadly speaking, I will use these two terms in, a, uh, in the same way. Um, strictly speaking, they're not quite equivalent. If you want to know more about that, come along to my session with Torsten Beeman on Monday afternoon. Um, but uh, if... Uh, if, if I say one, for the purposes of today, I'm broadly talking about both. So, interactions or moderation, um, any time we've got this situation where a relationship differs. Um, just a few examples from the literature of slightly more complex models, to begin with this one, where um, we've got a link between the number of ties, number of weak ties and creativity, uh, in this paper by, um, by Joe and, and colleagues, and... Um, they found that there's a curvilinear relationship, uh, some values to the moderator, and a linear relationship, the other values to the moderator. So that's getting onto a, a more interesting, more complex type of a um, model, uh, which uh, we'll come on to talk about a little bit later this afternoon. Um, we talked about two-way effects, but what about three-way effects? We'll come on to talk about these later as well. It's when you've got multiple moderators or three independent variables interacting with each other, producing um, more complex relationships. I'm not going to go into this in detail now. We'll come back to this, this example uh, in 45 minutes or an hour or so. Um, and then you might have interactions with non-linear models. So by non-linear, it could mean that curvy linear quadratic. Um, so I'm just realizing I'm standing in the way of the screen here, some of you. Um, uh, but it could also mean nonlinear regressions, such as in this case Poisson regression models. Um, and you see the nonlinear patterns there. So there's something else we'll get onto uh, as well a little bit later. Uh, but to begin with, I'm just going to take it right back to the start and what a simple two way interaction using moderated regression analysis would look like. So, the key thing, you've probably seen this type of equation before, but if we've got a relationship between x, an independent variable, and y, the dependent variable, um, normally that would just be have a relationship like y equals b0 plus b1x. That's what a typical simple linear regression would look like. But if we've got a moderator, which, uh, here is represented by Z, and I'm British, so I normally say Z, uh, but I'm in the US, so I'll, I'll try to say Z while I'm here, but if I get that wrong, forgive me. Um, that's my, my disclaimer at the beginning. Um, we also have these other two terms. We've got a, a Z term, and we've got an XZ term, where X and Z are multiplied by each other to create this interaction term. Why, why is that? Well, if you rearrange this mathematically, it looks like this. So we've got y, the dependent variable, the predicted value is being equal to some function of an intercept b0 plus um, another coefficient times z. So that doesn't depend on x um, there. And then we've got another one which does depend on x. Uh, we've got b1 plus b3z. So, in other words, the relationship between y and x depends on the value of z. And that's why multiplying these two things together gives us the means to test out this moderation. So, Miko's going to talk to you now about how we actually start interpreting those before we start getting into the software. Yeah, if you think about how you interpret normal regression for a piston, 
implied in, in the equation here, the effect of, of x increasing x by one unit increases y by beta one unit. So that's the normal regression interpretation. But that assumes that everything else stays constant. But if you increase x a little, then to make the xz will also increase a bit. And because of x affecting actually two different terms, the equation, the interpretation of these models is a bit more complicated than the interpretation of normal regression. And for that reason, we normally do plotting. So here we showed you a few plots to motivate. But, uh, and this is another plot from a uh, paper by Heckman. So this is an A and J, best paper work in their paper. And they study the effect of uh, physician quality from patient satisfaction uh, for male and female physicians. So they are looking at discrimination in this paper. And uh, their hypothesis is that men are rewarding more for productivity than female. And they plot two different recursion lines to interpret what the effect actually looks like. Now the question is, how do you get from this fairly standard regression table to this kind of plot that tell, then tells you how the effect looks like for these two groups? You do it this way, you basically take the, uh, the regression coefficient Recursive model, and now I realize that when we uh, put my slides, Jeremy's template, they are the line uh, arrangement went wrong. But we take the second regression model, so this is the uh, moderation model, so we have these interaction terms here, and uh, to produce this plot, we will take the regression coefficient of gender, the regression coefficient of quality. And the regression coefficient of the interaction term of gender and quality, and we calculate predictions using SMART. So we plug in some values for gender and quality, and we calculate four points on this plot. So men and women, we would probably have gender zero indicating men and one indicating female, but because these data are standardized. We have to work with standardized values. So, so we choose standardized values of minus 0.78 for male and 1.27 for female. So we calculate four points at two different values of gender and two different values of quality. One convention when you work with standardized data is to pick the high value and the low value as minus one and plus one. So we do that. So quality gets values of minus one and plus one. And now we just plot these values, minus 0.78 and minus 1 into that equation there, gives us a predictive value of cost and satisfaction. So we calculate values using the regression equation with these four combinations of the interesting of the moderator and the interesting value, the main independent value. Then we plot them, and it gives us the plot. So we have four points that we then connect with lines, and that gives us the plot. So this is how you do moderation interpretation using plotting. You calculate predictive values using the regression equation. You just multiply two variables with two regression coefficients at four different combinations of those two, uh, two variables, and then uh, do plot. There is the coupling the predictions and doing the plotting parts in this analysis. We'll talk more about those two states a bit later in the session. Yeah. So that's the same one. One nice way to practice doing this is to calculate the plots by hand for published papers like I did here. So can you reproduce a plot from published paper using the data reported in that case? In Hetman's paper works really well. So that is the same. All right. Yeah, so um Hopefully, by the time we finish today, you'll feel comfortable in producing plots yourself. But also, hopefully, you won't need to, because we're going to talk about how to do that using software too. So um, that can save you a bit of time. But it's it's worth understanding what it is you're doing. Yeah, a, a lot of things are easy to learn if you do them by hand using Excel, like regression analysis. You can calculate using Excel and just calculate some of squares and minimize that using solver. If you can do that, we understand Excel uh, regression pretty well. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, absolutely. Um, so, all of the examples, well, most of the examples we're using today um, are based on this um, example data set, which is available at the, uh, the link. For those of you who have uh, joined more recently, I will put up the, uh, a QR code again uh, in a little while, which will take you to the web page for resources. Um, but this uh, data set, uh, which is in SPSS format in the, um, on the web page, um, includes 424 cases, um, independent variables, we've got their training, autonomy, responsibility and age, they're all continuous. Um, we've also got dependent variables which are um, continuous, job satisfaction and well-being, uh, whether or not people received a bonus, which is binary, and the number of days absence, six, six absence people have had in the previous year, which is a count of discrete variable. That's just by way of introduction. We don't need to worry too much about all of this, um, but we'll use these, some of these variables in the examples as we go through. So, if you're familiar with regression analysis and you've understood how the models are formed, what this slide is doing shouldn't be any surprise to you. It's just giving you the, the syntax in the three different software packages we talked about uh, for running a two-way interaction or moderation model. Um, it's worth just asking at this point, um, who uses which software? So, could you put up your hand if you use SPSS? Okay. Can you put up your hand if you use R? Uh, or even two hands in some cases. Um, and can you put up your hand if you use data? Okay, so. Majority. It is a bit, well, whether it's majority or not, it's a bit of yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, data wins. Um, but actually, there were good, good proportions for all three of these. Personally, I don't use data very often, so Miko is very much the expert in data here. Um, I use SPSS uh, quite a lot. I use R quite a lot. Um, uh, but I'm going to talk about the SPSS stuff, maybe a bit of the R stuff. Miko will talk about uh, Stata and, and, and R as well. Um, it's worth making this distinction, though, because the way you go about some of these things will depend on what software you're using. And in particular, for those of you who do use SPSS, it's a lot less flexible than the other software for doing this type of thing. You can still do almost everything that you would want to do. Um, but you might then have to, as we'll see in a moment, go and use different software for the plotting. Um, and it may be uh, that you need to put some extra steps along the way. So for example, if you're using the regression procedure in SPSS to do this, you actually need to compute an interaction term separately before running the regression, which is not something you have to do in the other software. In fact, you don't even have to do that in SPSS if you use a different function rather than the regression one. But we'll leave that aside for now. Um, all of this syntax is available in the files which are on uh, the web page of resources. Uh, for each software, it's in two different formats. You've got the um, the raw syntax in the format for the package itself, um, or you've got a, a, a PDF which shows not only the syntax but the output that it generates. So hopefully, um, at the very least, you'll be able to recreate that. Um, but anyway, moving on. Um, you're going to talk yeah. about the state of yeah. so one one big difference between SPSS and, and R and state up is that in SPSS you, you produce the interaction yourself and in, in SCADA and in R you specify the interaction as a part of the model that you estimate. You can go this way with SPR and SCADA as well, so you, it's possible to generate the interaction to yourself, but that is a bad idea because if you use this syntax where you specify the interaction in terms of part of the model, then all the plotting commands that take the model as an input are aware of that interaction and they know how to treat it properly. But if you generate a variable called R, 
train A, for example, then Stata would not know that that is an interaction between train and A and would not be able to plot it correctly. So you always specify interaction as a part of the model instead of a new, vari a new variable before estimation. And uh, one slide about the Stata syntax, because this is something that I was uh, wondering when I was learning Stata, is that uh, Stata has a background in, in uh, fields other than management. And in other fields, categorical interactions are more common than continuous interactions. Stata by default treats all variables that you put in the interaction model as categories. So every every uh, integer value or every whole number value of H would be a, a, a separate category. We don't want that. We want to treat H as a continuous. So to specify a continuous interaction, you need to have the, the C period prefix for the variable, so the state knows that that's a continuous variable. In contrast with, with uh, SPSS that has the variable type as a part of the variable specification, state does not really have the variable type. Then you have two hashes. How many of you know what is the difference between two hashes and one hash in an interaction? One person, two, three, the difference is that in two hashes, then I have it here, it automatically adds the first order effect. If you have just one hash, then you have to remember to specify train and age to part the reverse model. This is something that you should use always. It's always use both hashes. If you accidentally specify one additional hash in this variance variation syntax, Stata will just draw the, the extra a train or extra age variable and not be bad. If you want to learn more about how to specify interactions, this is the Stata command that gives you the help page of factor variable specification. Right. Okay, so I told you there'd be help in plotting these interactions. Because plotting the interactions is by far the most helpful thing you can do to try to interpret. There are other things which you might want to do as well, which we'll come on to, but plotting it uh, tells you the vast majority most of the time of what you need to know about it. Um, and there is a web page I have, which is linked in the uh, PDW um, resources page. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. It looks, it, it's a very dull uh, website. It could do with a refresh. Uh, and one of these days I might get around to that. But, uh, uh, but the important thing is it's got lots of links to different Excel files which enable you to, to plot the, uh, the interactions. Um, and I'm just going to show you, if you run that first interaction effect in SPSS, you get some output which looks like this. Um, we've got the coefficients table here. What you need to use these Excel files, well, in every case, what you need is the regression coefficients. And specifically, that's the unstandardized regression coefficients. Some software only gives the unstandardized coefficients. Some, like SPSS, gives both unstandardized and standardized. It is absolutely essential to use the unstandardized coefficients for this, because they're the things that make those equations that Vigo showed earlier work. If you really need standardized estimates, with interaction models, the way to do that is to standardize the variables before estimation. So no, don't standardize the estimates, but standardize the variables, then form the interaction, then estimate, instead of form an interaction estimate as standardized. Otherwise, the interaction term will be standardized incorrectly, and the, all the estimate, all the plots will be uh, grossly overestimate the interaction. Yeah, and, and we'll talk a little bit more later about um, standardizing and centering variables, because we'll, we will come on to have a bit of a discussion about that. Um, but it's these four numbers here that you need to put into um, the, the Excel file. And specifically, in this case, you put them in these cells here. Now, this particular um, Excel file, it gives you uh, lots of other things you can put in. Uh, you can specify which values of the 
moderator and indeed the independent variable on which to plot these effects. So to calculate those four points, it draws the line between, uh, as Mika was showing earlier. Um, it is fairly standard practice with a continuous variable to plot it at one standard deviation above and below the mean of that. But that doesn't have to be the case. And sometimes it might make more sense to choose a value that's more meaningful. As long as it represents a fairly typical high or low value of the variable, that's fine. And in fact, if you've got uh, a variable which is skewed, choosing values one standard deviation above and below the mean won't necessarily be equivalent to each other. So you might choose a more percentile-based approach. So you could take the, let's say, the 10th and the 90th percentiles of a variable to choose those to put in as the values at which to plot the slopes. Um, if you leave those blank and um, you put in the means and standard deviations, it will just choose one standard deviation above and below the mean. But I would caution everyone not just to do that automatically, but to think very carefully about what values you need. And of course, if you are using uh, binary variables, it's really important that you choose the actual values of those variables to plot it, which aren't necessarily one standard deviation above and below the mean. In fact, they won't be unless it's perfectly evenly distributed. Um, so, this is a relatively straightforward way of plotting uh, these if you're using uh, this method. And this is how you probably should do it if you're using an SPSS. But if you're using R or Stata, you can do it in a slightly more simple way. Yeah, so this is the Stata command for running an interaction model and plotting this the same plot. So we use this in the margins command this data. And if you specify the plot option, it will calculate you the, the, the points, the four points that we need. Combination of, of training, one and five, eight, 25 and five, and then plot. So it does the calculation and the plotting in one go. And in R, there is at least 10 different packages for doing interactions. And I've gone through maybe four different packages that I, I use. I started with John Fox's data effects package, and then I used a few others, and now I decided that marginal effects is the best package at the moment. When you pick a package, pick a one that works for you, and if you know one package well, then stick to it unless there's a reason to do something else. But if you have a clean slate of, of choosing something, I would recommend that you think what is the most general. So how many different kinds of models it supports? Marginal effects, the documentation says that it supports 80 different statistical models, including multi-level models and journal splitter models and, and whatnot. And which graphics library it supports? So R has uh, four different graphics systems. There is base graphics, then there's grid graphics, then there is lattice, which builds in grid, and then there's ggplot that builds in grid. And all of these are represent a different approach to graphics. I used to use base graphics, but nowadays I use ggplot almost exclusively because that forces me to think more about my data and what I want to communicate instead of thinking about which line I draw and which coordinates I use for that line. So it kind of abstracts out the uh, calculating the points for the lines and allows you to focus on what we want to communicate with the graph. So marginal effects is probably the best choice at this point. And this is the command for, for marginal effects. Another way of calculating a plot is to uh, do this in two steps. So you first calculate the predictive values and then you do the plotting. In Stata, this would be uh, kind of running margins first and then running margins plot. So you, you separate it into two different steps. Why would anyone ever want to use two commands instead of one command? The answer is that when you when you uh, separate the concerns, it gives you more control. So uh, Martin's plot allows you to customize the plot a lot more than the Martin's command does. And in some rare cases, you might want to, for example, combine results from different margins analysis and then plot them in a single run. Sometimes you want to do plotting 
that the Martin's plot doesn't do, and you have to do status two way plot. This is a more general plotting concept. The same with R. Sometimes you might have a plot in your mind, for example, three way interactions. You want to plot a three way interaction as a single plot with four lines. Well, plot predictions by default plots are three way interactions as two as a set of separate plots that means from the two way interaction. If you don't like that, well, there is no way to change that info. So you can choose your info's plots, specify that, and then specify the plot yourself using ggplot. So ggplot is the graphic system that the marginal effects package supports. If you want to learn more about marginal effects, there is a really great ebook or, or this like whatever interactive book it is, that explains there they are the design principles, how we use it, how it integrates with other packages, and uh, how it compares against other like John Fox's uh, effects package and what you should consider when you pick a package. So I would recommend any R user to take a look at this package and consider which one are there. So I converted this package earlier this year. And you can do advanced stuff. So this is from my paper uh, in RM 2022, uh, showing some fancy interaction plots that you can do with these packages. So this is with Stata, and this is the same R that we put in the paper. We have the code for both of these plots in the appendix of the paper. So we have non-linear models, so it's Poisson model, uh, uh, two-way interaction. We have confidence intervals with transparent uh, transparency, and then we have markers for observations as a multiple plot that indicates the different uh, values of the women variable, which is our moderator. So you can do a lot more information-rich plots when you practice this ability. It doesn't have to be just two lines. It can be more than two lines, and it can be it does not have to be lines. It can be curves, and so on. We'll be uh, give some examples of how we do this kind of more advanced plotting a bit later. Thanks. So you can get a plot. As I say, that does convey most of the information you need, but sometimes you want to go a little bit further. And there are various ways in which this is commonly done. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about simple slope tests and whether you should use them, and if so, how. Um, and then a couple of other uh, alternatives which um, might be better or less good, depending on. Uh, what you're trying to do. So, first of all, um, ah, sorry, I'm just going to go back to um, this here because um, I didn't recreate it with the latest slide. But we've got a plot here which shows a relationship between training and job satisfaction, and we've plotted it for people who are older and people who are younger. Specifically, we've got the dotted line showing people who were 55 years old, and we've got the solid line for people who were 25 years old. And you can see that the solid line is steeper than the dotted line is. So this suggests that for people who are younger, the relationship between training and job satisfaction is more positive. But you might have supplementary questions about this. So, for example, for those in the age 55 group, it, it's still positive, but it's not closer to being flat. You might ask, well, at that particular age, is there any evidence that there is a relationship? Is it different from zero? That's what a simple slope test is. And note that it is very specifically asking about that age. It's not asking about older workers in general. It's not asking about people who are aged between 50 and 60. It's asking, at that particular point, is there evidence of a relationship between training and job satisfaction? So if that's something which is useful for you to do, you can do the simple slope test. Um, and there are actually two different ways to go about the simple slope test. Um, I tend to refer to these as the direct method and the indirect method. Um, and again, they're a bit easier in our state than they are 
if you've used SPSS. Um, so Mika will talk about uh, the other software in a moment. If you've done them in SPSS, what you need to do is get certain bits from the output of your analysis. And specifically, you need the variance of the coefficients of the independent variable and of the interaction term, and the covariance between them. So to get that, you need the variance covariance matrix for the coefficients. Note it's the coefficients, not the variables. You need that for. And if you put that information in, what this Excel file does is it automatically gives you simple slope tests for the two values you have plotted the slopes at. So you can change those values and get different tests. But again, just remember it's for those two specific values and they appear on the right. And in this case, for the age 20, sorry, the age 55, um, the shallower line there, see a p-value of 0 0.006, so still statistically significant um, there. However, oh, sorry, let me get to this first. Yes. So how do you do this with this data and R? In data, you again use marks. So all interaction, post estimates and analysis, or most of it is done in marks. In some specific cases, you might use contrast as well. But pretty much everything that you see in management will be done with marks. Normally, marks calculates your prediction. So it calculates you uh, the four points or how many points you want to have. And to calculate slopes, it's the predictions. Uh, you specify this dy dx option. So it's, it's d, dy dx comes from the derivative of, of y with respect to x. And it gives you the slope. So we are going to get the slope of our train at two ages, and then marks to calculate that for us. With R, some of the older packages like John Box's more effects might not be able to calculate this. But the uh, marginal effects has a slopes function. It just specifies slopes, whatever model you are you're analyzing, which variables and what values you're introducing, and then uh, you get the estimates. These are the same estimates, simple slopes that you would get with Excel, and then you get the, uh, the, the p values and, and confidence across for those effects. So, what the S? Yeah. How many of you know what is. Uh, what is the S? There's P value, but now there is an S value. S value is, is similar to P value, it's called surprisingness. And it quantifies the P value. So uh, they are surprisingness quantifies how many times you would uh, get a, a tail from a trip of fair coin and how unlikely that would be. So getting a uh, this p value is equally unlikely as it's to get 42 tails straight when you flip a coin. And some people have suggested that that's better than a p value. I, I, I tend to agree, but I still don't think that that's going to come to management very soon. But some things use s values than p value, so that's why. I didn't know about this until this morning either. Um, I did not know, or know about it until I read the documentation about this package. Yeah. Um, but, but I do like it, it's quite intuitive in the way that uh, um, you understand the, the lack of likelihood of something. Um, so that's what I call the direct method, because basically it just plugs all of the values into a formula and get, gives you a, a test result out of it. But there's no other way you can go about doing simple slope tests or, or similar types of tests called the indirect method. Um, and it's worth just mentioning this because if you understand the principle of the indirect method, it enables you to do all sorts of other post hoc tests with not only these interaction models, but any kind of regression based model. It relies on the, um, the fact that any coefficient of a variable is equivalent to the effect of that coefficient when everything else remains the same. Specifically, if the moderator has a value of zero, then um, the interaction term would also have value of zero. So it will mean that the independent variable at that point gives the simple slope test for the moderator being zero, which means you can rescale the moderator 
so that the zero point is any particular value that uh, you want it to be. So if you want to test an effect when the moderator has a value of 100, you'd subtract 100 from the original value of the moderator to create a new variable, rerun the regression, and then your independent variable uh, is what gives you that simple slope test. So say it's not necessary to do it for this, but that knowledge can give you all sorts of extra um, capacity for doing other things later. And in a few moments, we'll talk a little bit about centering variables uh, and the logic for why that might be beneficial relies on the same principle there. Another useful use for this technique is if you're learning about interactions. So one thing that I find useful for me when I want to learn something new is to do the, the, the new thing one way and then do the new thing in another way and see if I get the same result. So if you use the simple slopes test using the Excel sheet, and then you calculate this uh, uh, risk and variable, take a look at it if you get the same result. If you don't, then you are, you've done something correct there. That's a learning point. Yeah. So uh, we won't go through the syntax again. Again, it's on the, uh, on the files uh, which are available to you. Um, but just a few thoughts about simple slope tests before we continue, because in some journals they seem to almost require them by default, um, and I don't think that's a healthy thing. Um, they can be very useful if you've got specific values which are worthy of testing, but I don't think doing them automatically for one value, sorry, one standard deviation of below the mean of a moderator is particularly informative because if you change what those values are you're going to get a different result to the test. Um, most of the time there's nothing specific about those one standard deviation of below values. The test that I often use is could I specify in advance before I've even collected the data what values of the moderator would be worth testing this at and if you can and that suggests it's worth doing, or it might be worth doing. If you can't, it might not be worth doing. And there are some examples, for example, if you've got a, a binary moderator with only two values. In that case, clearly it makes sense. You know what the two values are. Testing whether an effect is different from zero at those two values is sensible. But remember, that's all you're doing. You're testing to see whether an effect is different from zero at a given value of the moderator. So I wouldn't suggest doing this all the time. And I do do them myself, but I always think carefully about them before I do. So what can you do instead? Well, one thing which um, has been used a bit in management research is the johnson neyman approach, uh, also known as regions of significance. Um, and this in some ways gets around the arbitrary nature of choosing values of the moderator to test slopes at. It asks the question in reverse. It says, at what values of the moderator would this give me a significant result? So in some senses, that gives us extra information, but it does also, certainly in what I've read, lead to inappropriate conclusions about is because you get a, a region, but those, that region isn't describing the population in any useful way. It's just saying, if we happen to test it at any of these values, would it be different from zero? Well, um, the truth is, if you've got a larger uh, sample size, you're going to get a larger region of significance. Is that a helpful thing to be able to say? Well, there are situations when it can be um, more descriptive, but it's, again, it's not something I think is particularly uh, useful to do uh, uh, all the time, um, and I tend never to use this myself. To this. So what do I do instead? Well, um, this is actually a kind of work in progress, uh, but it comes down to the fact that really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to describe an effect 
I'm not trying to describe it in significance terms. We're trying to say something about the population we're measuring. What is this effect? And there are three elements to the interaction effect that it's worth um, commenting on what he's thinking about. Um, so the three elements basically are, are given by the effects for the independent variable, the moderator, and the uh, interaction term. Now, one thing um, that I'm just realizing would be more sensible to accentuate stuff before this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's go on to the century. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so, Bigo, I'll let you take this one. Okay. Yeah. Century is something that a lot of people do. Uh, they perform in the interactions. And uh, when I, I teach my students in my graduate class, I have a big slide that says, never said they're there. Others disagree. There are reasons for centering and reasons for not centering, I and mean, it depends on the context. I never center my data. I prefer to do, uh, I call it calculating effects at different values of, of the variables. I use margins if I use data, all right? I use uh, the, the R package because it allows me to do post estimation. I don't need to center anything. But then again, uh, if, you, if you do the alternative method for calculating simple slopes using SPSS, Centering would be a useful thing. But I, I think state on R in that context, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. So the, the pros of centering is that when you have that one recursive polyarchism of X in your, your table, it gives you the effect of X when the moderator is zero. And well, if, if zero is beyond the range of your data, if you want to moderate that, if you have A's as a moderator, for, uh, for working age population, then the effect of x would be calculated at h equals zero for working age population. So that effect is uninterpretable because it would be on the range of the data. When you center the data, then you take uh, the, the effect at somewhere in the middle of the world range. So if you have data for working age population, then the effect of your interesting variable would be somewhere around 40 years, but it's the average age of working, working age of 18 years. So why not do it? If you plot your results, then your plotting will be offset. So uh, age would be, you would be plotting from, from minus 20 to plus 20 years of age, if you think about 40 years here uh, working for. It doesn't matter, ultimately, for the interaction. So interaction effect, the coefficient of the interaction term will be the same regardless of the inter whether you are know, center or not. And to show that, here's some R code. So I generate some data, and uh, this is just a standard on uh, variable. So x1 and x2 have means of zeros, and x1, x2 is their product. We can see that the product is highly correlated with x1 and x2. And uh, when we center the data, and then calculate the interaction after centering, then it will be uncorrelated with x2 and x1. They are not independent. As you can see, there is a clear statistical relationship, but it's not a correlation relationship. It rather affects the variance of the variance of the data. So centering means that you take the mean of the data and you subtract the mean from the original values. And uh, standardization means that you center and then you divide by the standard deviation of the variable. So if we use that one variable. So, so what is the difference? If we estimate these interaction models using this data, we can see that the only thing that centering does, if you have x1 and x2, is it affects the intercept. We don't normally look at the intercept. I don't remember any papers interpreting the intercept. So centering would be completely useless because it only affects the parameter that is not independent. When you do an interaction, then what happens is that not only the intercept, but also the x1 and x2 are different. But the interaction term, the coefficient will be the same. So that doesn't change. How to understand that? Well, to understand it, take a look at these three dimensional plot. 
if I would have a screen where I could animate this, it would be easier to, to understand. But, but think about it a bit. So, so this is our X2, and this is our X1, and this is our, our Y variable now. And our model says that the effect of X1 varies as a function of X2, or the other way. But let's focus on, on the effect of X1. So if X2 equals zero, then X1 is this blue line. So it's, it's, it goes up, but it does not go as steep. When X2 increases, the reversive slope of X1 gets steeper. So the reversive slope of, this, of X1 is not constant, but it depends on X2. And the question about centering is, that when we have a regression table, we present there only one regression coefficient for x1. Which one of these lines should we pick? If you don't center, then you are picking the blue line. So it's an effect when x2 is zero. If you center, then you pick the green line, which is effect of x1 when x2 is at the mean bound. If you, if you interpret the X2 coefficient, then centering makes a lot of sense. But most of the time, we don't interpret the effect of X2, rather we plot the data. And in that case, centering complicates plotting because your, your scales of your axis will be shifted sideways and you will have negative agencies or, or negative genders or something like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so we should have great for questions. Uh, we will do just, uh, just finish this little bit first because um, the whole thing about centering then is that uh, there are benefits and there are uh, disadvantages, but essentially it doesn't make any difference to your findings as long as you go through the procedures correctly. Um, however, um, and regardless of which software you, which software you're using, you might get this through some of the supplementary commands, uh, or if you're doing it in SPSS, you might want to center the data to get this. The thing about those X1 and X2, or X and Z effects, um, the main effects, if, they, the, if the variables have been centered, then those then effectively give you the average effect of that variable across the range of the other, which might be a useful thing to be able to interpret. And if you're describing an interaction fully, I think often is a useful thing to be able to say. So in this particular example here, the three elements which are given by this is we've got um, a positive effect, which is always positive. We can see from the main effect of the X variable that it's a positive relationship on average, which we wouldn't necessarily have got if we'd not sent the data, depends how it's scaled. Um, by studying the uh, moderator term, we'd be able to see that it's, uh, it's a disordinal uh, moderator effect, which is where the lines cross. Sometimes being able to say where they cross can be a useful thing to say. Um, but also the interaction itself is positive. So if the XZ coefficient is positive, that means that as the moderator increases, the relationship between X and Y becomes more positive. And that's a really interesting thing, a useful thing to be able to say sometimes. And in particular, um, the B3, which is the XZ coefficient, um, that uh, coefficient tells us the size of that effect. In other words, as the moderator increases by one unit, how much does the XY relationship increase by? And far more so than a lot of other uh, interaction effect sizes which are out there, things like F squared or change in R squared or uh, whatever. They give a certain amount of information, but they don't tell you in terms of the original variable, what the scale of those original variables is. And I think most of the time, that's the kind of effect size that we're really interested in. What's actually happening as these variables change? So I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail now because you would be yourself in, if you download the slides. Um, but I think any attempt to thoroughly describe the interaction uh, will be helpful, and a lot of the time more useful than doing simple slope tests. 
as Miko says, it's probably time that we had a um, had, had a break for some questions. So let me just get to. Um, oh, just just bef just before we do that, uh, I've mentioned binary variables a couple of times. We're not going to uh, give examples of this because if you've got a binary moderator or even a binary IV, you just follow exactly the same procedures. Um, it's just that you then plot it at those two values of the independent variable. Um, and the simple soap tests are definitely meaningful in this case. Okay, so let's pause now and take any questions, everything we've discussed so far. Uh, I think your hand was up first, and I've got to get to this. Uh, just a quick question about the, the confidence interval, because uh, when you run like margin plot and theta, uh, unless you supply those CI, the option at the end, they give, it gives you a confidence interval, and sometimes I'm not exactly sure how to interpret those confidence intervals. I'm not really sure if you're going to talk about it in the later half, but I would just kind of, and, and I think, so a lot of cases I just kind of uh, get the confidence interval to disappear to look at, have the, look at the clean, clean graphs, but I wasn't exactly sure how I could deal with that. Okay, uh, we'll talk about confidence in a bit later. Okay, I have examples in Stata, and uh, the, the way to deal with confidence intervals is if you don't use them, don't leave them out, make them semi-transparent so that they're not distracting, so they're available for a person who wants to see them. Also, don't have them uh, use the, the error bars, but rather convert them as, as bands so they are they're less. Yeah, so this is uh, this with R, and it contains. Uh, Semi-transparent, it's hard to see the projector, but because it's really up on the screen. Semi-transparent are confidence intervals. They're not distracting, and uh, we can see that they overlap here quite a lot. But for example, these two lines here, the confidence intervals are, are clearly distinct from these two lines here. So you can still infer something even if it's not getting on the way. Uh, the difference in if the confidence in one line is within the confidence interval of another line. I would interpret that as saying that we don't have enough evidence to conclude that those lines differ substantially. Even if the regression results give you statistically significant interaction effects? Yes, it, because then you're looking at basically uh, the, the predicted values are different. So uh, the effect can be different, but in the, the outcome might not be different. So, so for example, we, we might have a scenario where, where a study has a statistically significant effect on exam performance, but we might have two students who <coughs> study so little and another one that doesn't study. And the exam performance between those two students would not be statistically significant. So you are looking at two different questions. You're looking at the question of <coughs> is the effect statistically significant? And is the outcome of that effect for a certain change in an independent variable statistically significant? So, okay, one, one final kind of thought, sorry to take so much of your time, but you said if I'm looking at continuous variables, interaction between continuous variables, that confidence interval and the plotting would also depend a lot on which values I pick out for the plotting. Yes. Okay. And that is, that is uh, like we can say that studying a statistically significant effect. On exam performance, but if you study just for one minute, it doesn't have a statistical significant uh, effect on your performance. So these are two different questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question about centering that I've been curious about. Uh, if I had repeated observations, for example, in a pattern model, um, is it the correct way, this is my intuition, uh, to group standardize them so by time point. For example, in time point one, uh, I take all my observations and send to them in time point two. So groovy centering, so to speak. Or should I grant me centering? Take all together. Because if I'm interested in within subject effects over time and interaction on them, uh, I should be intended them. Yes, so if you are interested in within effect, you can group means that the data. That is a useful use of centering, but you can also accomplish the same by using a within estimator, a statistical package. 
or you can add dummies for the observation units. That approach is the same. But this is a bit beyond the, the scope of this session. Like, how do you uh, center, uh, group me center, wrap me center? How do you use cluster names? That's like multi level modeling. We'll say a little bit about yeah. multi level modeling towards the end. But uh, yeah. yes. I, I explained uh, the different centering apps, right? This is important for multi level modeling quite a bit detail on my YouTube channel. Thank you. Um, what is the best way to pick the points or put multi So if there's no um, specific values that you can specify before, uh, and I would um, use a percentile approach, I'd probably take the tenth and the ninetieth percentiles in the observed distribution to represent high and low values, low and high values. And just as a follow-up, uh, what about clusters? Because I was implied that maybe look at the clusters of that moderator if you're going to be studying hard, and maybe use those. If you have clusters, like you have a, a, a multi-model distribution, which means that you have multiple peaks when you, when you plot it, then uh, those peaks would be like, 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 it's a gender, it's, it's a bimodal, we have a lot of people that identify as men, a lot of people that identify as, as uh, women, and then some people that identify in between, but are, that's a minority. So in that case, even if gender is not binary, or, or um, yeah, gender is the, the psychological variable, yeah. Gender is sort of a binary, it still makes sense to look at these two typical values. So yeah, you can look at modes, but another strategy is just to think about how is your variable measured like if you're a personality scale, that might be measured with an agreement scale of, of one to five, for example, then you might pick two or four as the moderator values. So they're more interpretable, yeah, in a sense, yeah. There's one other question here. Uh, Can you, only, oh, oh, sorry. Was it, uh, was it Jason who asked about the crossover model? So um, the magnetic effect is not significant, but um, for the simple slope test, the one of the line is uh, significant. Is that a way to like find out where is the crossover point of this um, model? Um, so yes. Uh, so uh, uh, in other words, at what value of the moderator would the effect be zero? Um, uh, there is. I'm relatively straightforward the way I'm doing it. I just can't stop top of my head. Think all of this. You can use this data. You can use a uh, test or link of the commands to calculate pretty much any linear combinations and set that combination to zero. So you can, you can calculate there are the more the, the simple slope is basically the, the product of the regression coefficient and and the moderator value. Then I will have to think it through, but, but status, use data or R or Yes, data use limbo. You use, uh, you use limbo from a test of data. If you write out the equation and says the, um, the x effect to be for zero, you can work it out in a couple yeah. of steps. And, and then you specify that in the, in the, the test. Okay, yeah. but I've got more questions. We don't have a whiteboard, so unfortunately, yeah. we have to yeah. it's not that it would do, but it's hard to do it in your head. Yes. We'll have one more question, then we'll move on. So. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the simple slope tests in uh, your Excel file. Uh, you mentioned the covariance uh, metrics and stuff. Uh, can you just explain how you get the covariance values uh, you need to put in the Excel? Uh, sure, so it depends which software you're using. Um, but if you're using SPSS, for example, then on the regression uh, procedure you need to include uh, the BCOV keyword, so BCOV on the statistics, ah, and it gives you an output. Yeah. Ah, so yeah. How, how many of you understand the idea of, of variance, covariance, major investments? Not many. Let, let's let's spend a one or two minutes to explain the idea. So, when you run a regression model, then that regression curve is your best estimate of an effect, but then you also get an uncertainty estimate. 
one by bystander there. So let's go back to the slide that's used. <laughs> Which one? Uh, the one with the, the, uh, the, the nice community controls. That one. So, so let's let's say that, that these are actually, this green is our normal recursion line. Let's ignore the moderation for, for a minute. And because we have a small sample, if we estimate the same regression line from a different independent sample, same population, the regression line is not going to be the same after different samples, right? So, so there is some variation in the regression line. And let's assume that these five lines ignore the moderator again. These five lines will be five regression lines estimated from five independent samples from the same population, so we can see that they vary. And standard error for variance of the slope quantifies the variance of, of these slopes. So that's our estimate. We also have variance in the intercept. So the intercept is not the same in all samples, but it varies. Standard there are quantifies. That's the variance of the intercept. So we have variance of the intercept, variance of the slope. And we can also see that the intercept and the slope hope that we, they, they correlate. It means that because all the points go to the middle of the data properly, when slope increases, this interest decreases. So there's a negative correlation between slope and intercept. So this uh, purple line has high slope, small intercept. Red line has a, a, a small slope, larger intercept. So you need those quantities to do some of the calculations. And all statistical software give you the various covariance of the estimates as a, if you specify that as an output option, because that's useful for some calculations that you do afterwards. Did that help anyone? Okay, I'm going to suggest we move on then, because uh, we're more than halfway through the time. Uh, we've covered a lot of the, uh, the fundamental concepts. Um, so if you've understood most of what we've talked about so far, you're in a good place in terms of how that's going to apply to more complex models. So we're going to talk for the next few minutes about some different types of complex models, starting with three-way interactions. So what's a three-way interaction? Well, it's basically a model where we might have two moderators, but it's not just the two moderators operating separately, but they interact with each other to um, say how the uh, X and Y relationships uh, are, are change as the two moderators change. Uh, it can be conceptualized in all sorts of different ways as well. It doesn't have to be thought of as two moderators operating like that, but this was uh, the, the example I put up earlier, the Marx Fair paper, which um, looked at creativity and uh, implementation, and a couple of different moderators showing how those two uh, changed. And we can see that there is, appears to be one slope in particular here, which is more negative than the others. That's where we've got low implementation instrumentality and low strong ties. Uh, and if that means nothing to you, then it doesn't matter because we just, it could provide any particular uh, moderated variables. But what do you do in practice? Well, it's basically extending the model that we had earlier for the two-way interactions. There we had X and Z and X times Z as the three things we put in. Here, we've got another variable called W, and we have to put in the three variables separately. There are three two-way interaction terms, XZ, XW, and ZW, and then one three-way interaction term, XZW. And it's that three-way interaction term which determines whether or not there is a three-way interaction. In other words, whether the combination of Z and W affects the relationship between X and Y. Um, so there are seven different terms here. Well, there's eight included in the intercept, but seven actual variables you would need to uh, include. Again, if you're doing this in, uh, in SPSS, you need to calculate those separately first. If you're doing it in R or state, you don't. However, a word of warning before this, because three-way interactions they're not that complicated, but we are getting into more complex territory here. And in particular, um, these are more difficult to find. The power to detect a three-way interaction is lower, quite a lot lower than it would be to detect a main effect or a two-way interaction. You probably need a few hundred cases to have 
uh, reasonable power to detect a three-way interaction. So before you start to do this, ask yourself, is your theory good? Because if it's not, and you find something, then it might not be a real effect. Is your measurement good? Because if it's not, your reliability is lower, your power is going to be down. So if you've got both of those things in place, by all means, carry on. If not, you might want to stop and think about your um, research choices. <coughs> Uh, but actually testing them, again, the syntax is in the files that we've supplied. Um, again, you'll see in SVSS, uh, you've, we've actually calculated the, the, each of the two-way effects, uh, the two new ones and the three-way effect before running them as part of the regression procedure. But in R and Stata, uh, what we said earlier, right, the same here. Yeah, just that three variables, I mean, the automatic bad or um, and the hypothesis that we'd be testing here, well, it could be all sorts of things, of course, but it would be something like training predicts job satisfaction most strongly for younger workers with high autonomy. So you're specifying what combination of the two moderating variables would be associated with what change in the relationship there. Uh, we don't need to go through the the difficulty of exactly uh, how to do what here because hopefully it will be fairly obvious from this three-way interaction template that we've got eight different coefficients to put in this time, the, the seven variables plus the intercept. We've got the uh, variables at which to plot slopes for all three, or the means and standard deviations for um, three variables there. And we get something like the plot on the right. Um, now, if you want to plot it in R or Stata, you can take this. Yeah. If you want to plot it in, in R or in Stata, it's the, the same. So just specify that now we have uh, three different values. So instead of having two values, we have three values. And so we don't calculate four points, we calculate eight points. In R, in marginal text, this is a good example of the value of the, the strategy of calculating the points first and plotting them later. Because if you specify what predictions, you specify what it was or not, it was true, it draws you a, a plot where you have two plots uh, of two two way plots. So it doesn't produce your three way plot. But it produces you a two set to two way plots, and then you calculate a three way interaction or you innovate a three way interaction by comparing those two plots. So we would have four lines in the state of plot like we had in the previous slide, but this R example would produce you two plots of two lines each, and that is how the package is designed. So instead of using the, uh, the plotting, the drawing function from the package, we can just use GT plot directly and then uh, specify that we have a group out of autonomy of age. So we draw four, four uh, lines and then we specify the line. So sometimes the package doesn't give you the kind of plot that you want. And in that case, you just take the predictions out of the package, plot them yourself. The same with data. Margins plot can, can give you most of the time the correct plot, sometimes you need to do something exotic, then you can do uh, just normal to great graphics. Okay. So, in terms of interpreting it, plotting again gives you quite a lot, but not quite as much in terms of the possible interpretation for a three-way interaction as it does for a two-way interaction. When we plot a two-way interaction, um, depending on how we did it, we we'd end up with two lines, not and the fact that the interaction was significant, if it was, would mean that those two lines are significantly different from each other. That's a direct equivalence. But because we've got four lines for a three-way interaction, we can't say the same thing. We can't say which lines are different from which lines, just from knowing that the three-way interaction is significant. But that might be a really important part of the interpretation. In fact, most of the time it should be. Because if you specified a hypothesis for a three-way interaction carefully, 
it should imply which lines would be more positive or more negative than other lines and which might not matter. So for example, what we said here is that job satisfaction would, uh, tr sorry, training predicts job sat satisfaction most strongly for younger workers with high autonomy. That means that the, the line, the, the blue line in this simplified graph here, um, which is for young workers with high autonomy, that should be more positive than the rest of them. So we can actually test that using a slope difference test. Um, and this is something uh, that I would always recommend doing for a three-way interaction. Um, simple slope tests you can do. Exactly the same caveats apply as for a two-way interaction, but for the slope difference test, this is going to help you understand that three-way interaction a lot more carefully. Um, and you need to put in more information from that variance covariance matrix. Uh, if you're doing this in SPSS again, um, you need to extract that and put it into Excel. Um, and I should also add a warning that if you are using SPSS for this, for some bizarre reason, it often messes up the order of the variables in the covariance matrix. Um, I don't know why, and it's really frustrating, so you just have to take extra care that you are choosing the right variables there. Um, but if you uh, put those in, you get six slope difference tests because there are four slopes in the plot, four lines, which means there are six pairs of lines, so six differences. And the Excel file will automatically test all six, but actually, for your hypothesis, there's probably a subset of those which are relevant. So in the case for younger workers with more, uh, with higher autonomy. So that's the, um, uh, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's difficult to see with the, uh, <laughs> with, with the projector, but it's the, it's the third slope on this plot here. You might not, might or might not be able to see that clearly. What that's suggesting is that, that's, yeah is um, that that's more positive than the other three. So we look at the pairs of slopes, testing slopes one and three, two and three, and four and three, and we would see from those that indeed all three pairs are significantly different from each other. So, and in the direction we would expect. So that supports the hypothesis that we had there. Um, and if you're doing it in the state of law, we go to the state, yeah. So this is in data. You use the test command, or you can use the link command, it doesn't make a difference. Test is my favorite here because we are not testing. So test command makes a lot of sense. What we are doing is that we are testing uh, the, the value of the recursion coefficient that specific values of the moderator. So it's writing the, uh, the recursion equation. So we are saying, that the difference of 25 years of, and, uh, in, in uh, age multiplied by the interaction of train and age and train autonomy and age, it will make not make a difference. So we're saying that this 30 year age difference between the young and old people will not make a difference to the employees. So we just multiply all interactions that contain AIDS with uh, 85 minus 25. We could also calculate 30 years of self, but this communicates the intent of the analysis better than just putting that number 30. If I had 30 there, you might not be able to connect it directly to the plot that had 25 and 55. So doing calculations in code is sometimes more transparent than doing it on, on paper, even though it produces a bit longer output. So that will test uh, the difference between slopes one and two. And uh, you can do the same things in slopes two and four. And slopes two and three, two and three we are testing uh, young people who have high autonomy, put it that way, put that way. Uh, yes. high, high young high people high. with high autonomy against old people with low autonomy. So we, we adjust both variables and we multiply them 
this interaction term that contains both of those two variables using uh, the inference, the inference of the interaction. So this is the interaction variable, and then you calculate the difference between two lines. So if you if you uh, compare the lines, I think really it becomes pretty clear how you do it. And you do the test command, you will get confidence intervals for this test and, and key values and, and everything else that you need. And you know, R, the same thing. You would use the hypothesis command, and there is a, a small little detail here that because the interaction term in the R's regression command holds interactions with the column in, in the variable name. This is a special character in R syntax. So you have to escape the variable name using this backfix. So this is just something that you need to know. It does not work without the backfix. And uh, so we are testing again the same thing. The hypothesis that the effect of 30 years difference will not make a difference for the trade for the uh, for the effect of training. So basically it's the same basically same the same the same, same, same principle. If, if you go from from state up to R, it's kind of like you you work this the exact same way. It's it's like speaking the same language. It's the same grammar, but the vocabulary is a bit different. So just to summarize some principles about three-way interaction effects testing, um, if you do have a hypothesis about a three-way interaction effect, specify that as clearly as you can. Uh, and that should enable you to know which supplementary tests, occasionally simple slope tests, quite often slope difference tests, you would want to do to try and verify that hypothesis. If you don't have a reason to do a test, then you don't need to do it. Um, so even if the software does it for you automatically, you don't need to report that then. Um, of course, you can use this in an exploratory manner, but if you're using um, something like this for an exploratory piece of data analysis, you really do need to apply uh, appropriate care to your conclusions. I mean, that's always the case with exploratory analysis, but particularly so uh, with this type of thing where there's all sorts of post hoc tests that can be done. Okay, so any questions about three way interactions? Um, yeah, is that possible to you, you know, make two variables in a three way interaction, make two variables as a set and test it for the third variable? And does it remind me if I have three, three, three variables which are at the binary variable? Binary variable. And we wanted the reviewer ask us to see the two first two variables in the set and test it for the third variable. And so you mean you you got two independent variables in the set and then in what the set and what, then what, yes. It's exactly the same. I mean the way you frame it, the way you report it might be slightly different, but statistically it's absolutely equivalent. Um, yeah. yeah, you have to be a bit more specific of what what it means to test them as a set. So are you mean that you are testing uh, a multiple hypothesis that both color business are the same across the groups at the same time? So you would do a multiple hypothesis test if there was a single hypothesis. And uh, you would use uh, a, a wall test for that. Yeah. The statistical software and software you use. And maybe Stata. Well, Stata's test command does multiple uh, hypothesis testing. Mm -hmm. So instead of specifying uh, one point, like go back to the status test. So here we specify that 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 one with for example this this monstrosity here equals zero, then you just add the second effect and that set that to zero and data calculates you the uh, the joint test for both hypothesis at the same time, calculates, gives you three key values, key value for the one constraint, this one for example. E value the other constraint to e value for both constraints at the same time. And it's the same on the line model. Yes, yeah, same thing, same, same way to specify multiple tests. Uh, thank you very much. So, when you do it in, uh, with hierarchical steps, 
<clears throat> and um, you have also in the hypothesis on lower order um, um, interaction effects. Uh, how, what does it mean for my interpretation if the lower order vanishes after uh, using the last step with the um, three-way interaction? So in general, if you've got a significant higher order interaction, say a three-way interaction, yeah. then that's the, thing, that's the model you should be interpreting. Um, and, and whatever you found in the earlier models effectively is irrelevant at that point because um, you've got a better model. Um, so that's a situation where uh, if you're interested in the low order effect still, uh, I would suggest either centering your data so you can interpret those in the final model or, or, or performing additional hypothesis tests using margins or depending on the software uh, to see whether those earlier hypotheses were still supported. But, uh, but you should always interpret the best model you get. And if the three-way interaction effect is significant, then that's your best model. Yeah, if, if you think about it, it's the same problem that occurs when you have a, a normal reversal model with no interactions and you add an interaction curve and then your, your original effect becomes non significant. Well, it doesn't really need much, it's just that the, the new coefficient is simply not the average effect, but it's the hit effect when the moderator value, value is at zero. So when you add uh, a third order interaction, then uh, your effect of your hit, hit, hit interesting. The interaction of the second order interaction is then given at the point where the third variable that you added to the interaction is zero. And sometimes that point mm -hmm. might be the other data. Like when we add, if we think about the trading of the autonomy here, we add A to some order here. Then the, the, the interpretation of the concept of trading and autonomy would be for <coughs> Workers whose age is zero doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, either the center of calculate single slope or the interaction curve. Yes. Um, so I have a question. When you do what uh, categorical uh, interact three-way interactions, so my student has explained like if you do those, it tends to be perfect, um, like perfect prediction or, or like multi correlability when you have three-way interaction and then each of them like zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And so when I run like a regression, some coefficient would not be estimated because it's like perfect um, prediction. So how do you, how do you interpret that when, when some like lower order coefficient would not run at all because of the perfect co uh, multi-collinearity? Yeah, the multi-collinearity problem basically means that if you have a, a, a binary variable, let's say that you're a binary variable, uh, and you have like a gender variable, then that gender variable gives you the effect the difference between male and women, men and women, and you can't have a, a dominant for men, a dominant for women, and an and inter, intercept as well, because then you have just two values of independent variable. And you have a third or uh, three things to test. So that is not a problem for plotting at all. So uh, your software will believe if you meet dummies, the categorical variables, then you typically draw one of the categories of the reference. Main is usually a reference for, for women. So the reason called this gender is the difference between these uh, two genders. It does not give you the effect for women. So it is not a problem at all. Okay, I think we should go on because we want to talk about some nonlinear effects um, in the next section. Um, when we say nonlinear, um, there are different forms of this. So, Vika, you're going to take the, the piece on the, the non-normal Yeah, there are two main kinds of nonlinear models that we use to manage. Then we have generalized linear models, which apply a link function for a logistic regression model. It's not a line that we fit to the data, but it's a, it's a kind of like S-curve, starts from zero and goes up. Uh, converges to one and then goes flat again. And then we have Poisson regression model, a negative line of a model, and others that have, instead of a line, they have an exponential curve that they think. So that is the one kind. The other kind of non-linear model is this U-shape, where we add a second power of 
an independent variable to the bar. So how do we do uh, these uh, interactions with, uh, with general spin models? So we're going to be using uh, lots of degree as an example. And but the things work the same way. So instead of having uh, normal regression analysis, we have the logic function here. So what the logic means, or what is the equation, is not that important to know. But it's important to know that it produces it's sort of a lie, produces you a, a curve that goes flat first, at on zero, then goes up, and then goes flat, like close to one. If that produces one, if that produces zero, it never reaches one. OK, so that is the logic regression analysis. And uh, you estimate the logistic regression analysis using the logistic command is data, GN command in R, and logistic uh, command in SPSS. So when you plot these models, one thing that is very important to understand that you no longer calculate four points and connect them with lines because the model is not there. I wrote a paper about nonlinear models and we looked at interactions and maybe a third of papers that presented uh, this kind of plot for logistic regression analysis connecting these to endpoints with lines, ignoring the fact that it's a nonlinear model. So you should not have lines, you would have these curves. And, and Jeremy's Excel templates would automatically do the correct curves for you instead of lines. So this uh, there's templates for logistic um, models, uh, there's templates for, uh, for log link models, that's Poisson regression or negative binomial regression, uh, two way and three way ones available on our website. So make sure you choose the right one for the model you're using. The, the bottom line in using these Excel templates is that they work exactly the same way. And if we take a look at uh, the status index, instead of a regress, you use have logistic. And R, the model is specified the same way, just use TLM and specify binomial. And this is the only difference. So, slightly different model specification, you use a different template. Otherwise, it works exactly the same way. And you get a nice uh, curve linear plot. How you would do this with, uh, we don't have all this because, yeah, we don't have example in state, but it's on the, on the syntax that we have provide as an uh, attachment to the uh, system. Parts of the negative binary regression analysis, there's another template. These work exactly the same way. There's margin command for state up. There are the prediction command for, for the R smart cell index package. It's exactly the same syntax, no different whatsoever. It calculates it automatically because it knows that the model that you're fitting is not. But the important thing is to check that your plot actually contains the correct functional form. So we can see that this logistic regression model looks at the early part of the logistic curve where it's close to zero and only starts to increase. And uh, looking at the, the linear model, it tells a different story because there is not much of a difference between these uh, two age groups here and then for high age groups, there is more difference. So Poisson, you don't have the, the log of y's that you're modeling. In fact, it's sort of getting exponential of this regression model, and uh, you will get an exponential curve. Simple slopes work the same way. We only talk about in that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I, I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, sure. So it's probably just worth saying, actually, because uh, we haven't actually explained what a Poisson or the binomial model are was, um, we're assuming most of you will know, but you might not, so a Poisson model or negative binomial would be useful when you've got a discrete count outcome, uh, but with the caveats that Nico, Nico has um, explained. Um, and if you do need to use the um, simple slope tests on these, um, certainly if you're using SPSS, you can't do it in quite the same way. Um, and the Excel templates don't give you uh, a way to do that automatically for that reason. But you can do it using the indirect method. So if you understood the indirect method when I explained it um, an hour ago, whenever it was, that's exactly the same here. You can send the moderator around the value 
that you want to test it at and we run the analysis. Yeah, another important thing to understand about this nonlinear models is that it's the idea of the simple slope. So, so what exactly does a simple slope mean in this context? So is the simple slope the direction to which this line goes at this point, or is it more about the, the curvature of the logistic curve? So the idea of, of simple slope can be understood in uh, multiple different ways that we don't get into in this session. But doing these plots would be my choice over simple slopes because it would this is like linear, and I would also not need to explain how I understand simple slope. So simple slope can be understood at least in three different ways. It can be understood either as uh, how strongly these lines turn up. So it's not actually a slope at all. It's, it's about, more about curvature of life. So slope would be an incorrect term. It can be understood as a a marginal effect or tangent at a specific point of this line, or it can be understood as average marginal effect, which would be the average uh, slope along all parts of this line. So you can see that this quickly gets complicated. I would avoid talking about simple slopes. Average marginal effect is a better concept because it's more, it's less ambiguous, but then again, that's more technical. I would just do a plot, do a nice confidence interval, then interpret what does that plot be in the context of your research question. Good. Yeah, these questions around simple slopes, etc. This it is more complex for nonlinear models. I'll talk about quadratic models in a moment, where it's even more so. Um, but actually, the fact that we're having to specify exactly what the question is is trying to answer. Um, this should also give you pause to think about why you're doing simple slope tests even in a straightforward linear example, because it's answering a very specific question, not the type of general one which sometimes people think it will. Um, so yeah, this is exactly what uh, Nico was just talking about there. Yeah, and this is uh, another interesting thing, that if you talk about the, the interaction effect in nonlinear models, and uh, is this, is there, a moderate so does the gender moderate the effect of age and qualifications? Raise your hand if you think that gender moderates the effect of age and qualifications. Okay, raise your hand if you think that there's no moderation. Most of you prefer not to have an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that I talked about in a paper that I published in the beginning of last year about nonlinear models, is that we have to clearly specify what we mean by moderation when we are nonlinear models. If we specify moderation as the absolute difference, we can see <laughs> that the absolute difference in qualifications increases more for men than women. So in absolute terms, yes, there is clearly a moderation effect. We can see that the difference here is smaller than here. Moderation exists. But if we think about this in relative terms, so exponential model tells that the, the quantity of interest, the qualifications, increases not in absolute terms, but in terms relative to the current one. So every additional year of age gives you certain percentage of more qualifications. And that percentage increase is the same for both genders. So, so the, the curvature of both these lines, or curvature is not, but the exponential increase, the relative increase, is the same for both of these lines, but it produces different absolute outcomes. So it's our moderation of hypothesis or issue question about the relative effect or the absolute effect. We would have to specify that before we can ask for the question of whether there is a moderation effect or not. It is also possible that there is a negative moderation for the relative effect and positive moderation for the absolute effect. So it might be that, that men receive 
one person more qualification every year, and women receive two percent more qualification every year. So the effect is stronger for women. But it might be that on average, a man receives five more qualifications every year, and a female uh, receives three more qualifications every year. In absolute, on average. So there's a negative effect in, in absolute. So this is something that is, it's a conceptual question. It's not a statistical question, but we need to think about. So what exactly do you mean in, when you talk about correlation? So, to sum it up, Yes, this is, this is a paper. It's the paper that I was, I was saying. So, so I was referring to, and, and this is a data set of years of education and income for different professions in from the census of Canada from the 1970s. And uh, this is normal linear regression analysis. We can see that there's clearly a moderation effect. So men are men dominating professions receive more benefits for more education, whereas Women dominate, men dominated service women, women dominated, there is no effect of education. So if you are in a, in a, in a profession that is women dominated, then people in that profession generally don't receive more money, they get more education. But if we take a look at this curve, the, the exponential model, the relative increase for all of these effects, all of these groups is the same but it produces different absolute outcomes because men dominated professions on average receive more money. So, um, so what exactly do you mean when you talk about one race in the context of, of non-linear? Talking of non-linear, quickly talk about some quadratic models. Um, most of you will be familiar, I expect, with quadratic regression, basically if you put in not just the x term, but the x squared term, which enables you to model uh, a, um, a quadratic model, parabola effectively, or part of a parabola for the relation between x and y, which should be very flexible. It has certain limitations, of it's going to be symmetrical about the turning point, we can have exactly one turning point, which may or may not be within the range of the data you're looking at. But um, for the types of model which Certainly in, in, in management research we use all the time, they can be uh, good enough for uh, describing nonlinear effects. But what happens when these are moderated? Well, um, we have an extra couple of terms here because we've not only got the xz, we've got the x squared z term as well. So we've got five terms we would need to, to model uh, there. Um, and uh, there are two terms here which we might need to interpret. So the B4, which is the XZ term, if that is uh, different from zero, that means that the location of the problem, in other words, where it's where the turning point will be, and so on, uh, is different. Um, whereas if the B5, the X squared Z term, is non-zero, then that means the curvature itself will be different. So it would be I curve would be more spread out uh, or maybe in the opposite direction um, and these are both worth interpreting uh, but as before um, we're not going to go through the syntax now because we want to get through the rest of this in the next few minutes um, but you can plot it either using one of the excel sheets like this which will demonstrate that in this case we've got two lines of certainly curvature um, or you can plot it using uh, stator or R. And I don't know if you want to say about this, Nico, or should I carry on? Yeah. So uh, we can calculate it, calculate that way. And uh, margins, basically, it is aware that it is a uh, quadratic, because it's this quadratic is part of the model. And it says automatic calculate it. It's correct for you. The same thing with uh, draw predictions. If we use the polynomial function in R to specify the second order, uh, important to have the raw here because otherwise it produces all the polynomials, which is not something that we want. If we use the polynomial to multiply these things together, then uh, all the lower order terms are included automatically. And Bob Predictions is also aware that this is a, a U shape 
a, a, a polynomial model instead of what just a linear model. So this is a, a nice trick you sort of follow the function in R to get things a bit more automated. So you don't have to specify manually what kind of predictions you want to get out of the model. But then in terms of further interpretation, this is something where I think there is a bit more knowledge around these things. I, I, a few years ago, I probably got two or three emails a month saying, I've got a significant um, quadratic moderation. Um, how can I tell whether my uh, my simple slopes are significant? Fairly to realise that actually that's not a meaningful concept in the same way. Um, as Nico already explained for the uh, for the nonlinear models in terms of Poisson regression, for example, um, there are different ways in which curves can be different from each other or significantly different from zero. Um, so there are three. Uh, particular post hoc tests that I've seen people often want to do. Uh, I'm not saying you should do these as before. The question is do these particular tests help you answer your specific research question? If they do, you can do them. If they don't, don't bother with them. Um, so the first one is to test whether there is a curvilinear effect at a particular value of the moderator. In other words, at that particular value of the moderator, is there definite? curvature in the relation between x and y versus a linear effect, for example. The second one would be testing if there's any effect. So it might not be a curved effect, but it might be a linear non-zero effect at a particular value of the moderator. Or you might be asking whether there's a particular value of the moderator and the independent variable where the relationship is different from zero at that value. Um, now, all three of these are things that uh, we've included syntax for in the resources. We're not going to go through now because we've, uh, we can't deal with we've running out of time by this stage, but we've included them in slides. Um, it's also worth saying that you might have further questions to ask about three way interactions and slope differences and curve differences and so on. Uh, we're working on a paper at this moment, we're hoping to submit in the next few weeks. Uh, which will answer questions about that, but we're not going to go into that more today. Yeah, we can send some papers, so if you want to take a look. So, before we just do our, there's, there's a, just a, a short final section on other extensions, which we'll come on to, but before we uh, do that, any questions about the non-linear effects, non-linear interactions? Yes. For the non-linear model, it's also used for how many different It is the same data that we use for the non-linear models. Oh, yes. It's just a different dependent variable, if that is what you're asking. So uh, the cost of following the system and the data Yeah, that's right. So, so, so the examples we've included here in the, in the resources, they're using the same data set. We've used a different outcome variable so that we've got binary ones for the binary logistic. We've got um, a count variable for the Poisson models. Um, and actually, for the quadratic models, we might even have used the same outcome variable um, in the examples. I can't remember. Uh, but uh, it might be a different one, but in any case, it's, it's, it's a continuous uh, one. So, so for those examples we've included, it's assuming the outcome is continuous, but you can apply um, the same models, uh, non, uh, the quadratic models, to logistic regression or to Poisson regression um, and the three-way interactions. You can basically you can make it as complicated as you want, but the more complicated it gets, the more complicated it will be to interpret, and the greater chance there is of not finding uh, a real result. Yeah, how many of you, you know that Poisson looks like, like an exponential function, and uh, parabola looks like going up and going down if you have uh, like a polynomial x squared. What does the, uh, uh, the Poisson model that has an x squared in the model, what does that look like? How many of you know? That's normal distribution. So it goes up, 
than that. So if you ever want to model something that's not an issue, so number of publications, number of citations that a publication receives over time, roughly normal edition. Great use for for Poisson regression model with a uh, uh, quadratic effect of pi. Yeah, that's it. I think. Yes. Of the uh, one, so you yeah, basically. Again, I've just added to the complexity, which um, uh, makes it more difficult to interpret. But, but you know, if you've got good enough data and good enough theory, it might be reasonable. Let's just uh, go on to the final set of um, extensions. So, we go let you talk about multi level and this yet. Yeah, multi-level modeling and structural ethos of modeling. Multi-level modeling works the exact same way as data R. The commands for plotting are the same, so there is no need to change anything. And uh, in the Excel sheets also work for multi-level modeling results. There is one small detail that if you're doing testing or slope tests, then uh, instead of using uh, t-test, you will be using z-test. But in most cases, if you inappropriately use the t test instead of z test, there, there will be no consequences because they are so similar to the results. It only affects very small samples of those, those two, two different results. So, multi level model, as far as interactions go, basically regression analysis, not much there. And uh, go back, with SPSS, there is a, a bit of a, a software. Limitation because the multi level command for SPSS does not give you the variance for variance matrix test as part of the output. So that limits what you can do. But you can always do a <coughs> test of simple slopes by rescaling the original value. Then uh, about SCFs, SCFs are uh, related variables, are a bit more difficult thing to interpret. Because the scale of the latent variable is not that clear. If you have a, a, an observable of like age, or you have some of Q5 point scale items, you understand how that varies. But understanding the variation of, of the latent variable is something that is a bit more complicated. If you, you scale the latent variable by fixing the first indicator, then you can assume that the latent variable uses the scale of that indicator. So, uh, if you have a five-point scale and item as your, your first indicator of the latent variable, then uh, a large value for the moderator might be plus one, and a small value might be minus one for the latent variable. But this requires that you understand how the variable is scaled, and it's a uh, bit beyond the scope of this. This is other, otherwise doing interaction plots for latent variables is no different for the object variable. There are some specific uh, specialized functions. For example, if you use the R package Laban for latent variable models, there is the SCM tools and there is Pro 2 way MC. So uh, I don't remember where MC comes from, but it, it gives you plots. But that is the problem with those functions is that if you apply the functions, they tend to be for a specific purpose and uh, they are. Bit of a black box on what it does, and I spent half a day last week helping my wife to, to do go through way MC function plots, and we were wondering why do all the, the interaction curves always intersect at zero. So the inflex intersection point is always at, at the origin of the coordinates. And uh, after we contacted the developer of that function, we realized that that's a feature. It's not designed to model differences in intersects. In the proper way. And figuring out this kind of software where it works in these less known packages or less known functions is, is very hard. And oftentimes, when we plot an interaction, whether the lines start with the same point and then go, go different ways, or whether they start on different points and intersect, have different theoretical implications. And the fact that the package always does by design lines that intersect. Is not a desirable feature. So, if you ever want to do SCMs, I would recommend that you use a general purpose package for 
body interacts with your used exosuits instead of these uh, specialized functions, unless you are absolutely 100% sure what the, the, the package does and what kind of limitations it has. So we're just about out of time. Uh, I'm gonna uh, not say anything about sex in multiple interactions, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so you can read what's on the slide if you download it. Likewise, moderation and mediation, if you want to combine those, this isn't the place to talk about that, but uh, the process more, uh, macro is a, is a very helpful tool. It can't do everything, but it can do a lot of the, the more basic models that you might want to do there. Um, and advanced plotting, uh, is there anything you want to say about this in 10 seconds? Yeah, 10 seconds. Uh, advanced plotting. I would recommend that you plot confidence in class of your software supports as bands. It's not shown in the projector, but it's so nice on the screen. Also, show the observation to the plot so that we can actually see that the model is the data. It might be that there's this one, one point here, no point here, in which case your lines are greatly extrapolated. If there are no services here, and you know a line there, then you should not be interpreting this part of the curve. So that is our reason to your observation. So I talk about this examples in this table. That's data code. Next one. This is very complicated way of doing the same thing. Base R. So this is like, like base graphics R if you do the real programming. Next one. And this is more elegant way of using the package that you can use in the web -off. So it just shows that the package allows you to focus more on what you want to communicate instead of focusing on how do I program things to happen. Okay. Okay, so we are out of time. So rather than take questions now, I think we're okay. I'm certainly okay to stay, hang around for a few yeah, minutes and ask any questions if you want to come up. Uh, but we'll let the rest of you go. So thank you very much. I hope you've learned something. And there hasn't been one to give the evaluation forms out, but if you get those opportunity later to, to fill something in about it, please do tell us what you think. Thank you very much.